What the hell? <laughs> And then, oh. <laughs> See, this is great. You could put this on the podcast and people still listen. Yeah, but, man, okay. we can be more polished. We can okay. be more polished. We all can, right, let's we try can, this again. We can have our shit together. That's all, right. all, that's all I'm saying. Hi there, I'm Dr. Chris, and this is the first uh, podcast for the Source Points podcast series that uh, we're doing here at Explore. Yeah, and I'm Alan Chatney. And basically, we're podcast novices. Uh, you know, we've all listened to podcasts, but we, uh, we, you know, we don't know what we're doing, really. We just, uh, you know, we're just getting started. So let's see how this goes. All right. Let's, uh, well, we're, we're going to start off by talking about, first, why we're doing this podcast. And Yeah, why? Now, what are we calling this thing again? I think we're going with source points. Source points. Well, that was okay. your that was your suggestion. Yeah. yeah, that's good. That's a play on it's a play on the seismic source point. Right. right. So that's we're seismic guys, geophysical yeah. guys, and that's what we do. So I think what we're going to do is use these podcasts to talk about geoscience. Right? Uh, geoscience, yeah. probably state of the oil industry, generally oil industry in Canada. You know, maybe politics, movies. politics, maybe. politics. Yeah, absolutely. Politics, uh, the environment, environment, right? environment, ecology, things we think about every day. Opinion pieces is pretty much what we're going to be talking yeah. about. Now, I have strong opinions. Yours aren't as strong. No, as I've well. I have very loose opinions. They they are building up since having gone from an academic environment to a industry environment. It certainly changed my mind about how. I, I don't want to say money works, but how things get done in the world. It's no longer just six deadlines a year, four conferences, <laughs> two papers. Yeah. It's now, this is the way life really works. It's bam, bam, do it now, get it done sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Industry has a different pace than academia for sure. Both both matter, both are valuable, but but uh, definitely. So, yeah, absolutely. So, let, you know, I, I know who you are, but. Why don't we introduce ourselves and just kind of get get that out there? Do we have to introduce ourselves every time, by the way, on these podcasts? Do we have to let people After know? After a while, they'll know who we are. They'll know. People will know. People will know. Our, one, I mean, our four listeners will know who our, we are. Well, we're, we're hoping for a little bit more. But right off the bat, we'll, we'll, I guess we'll start with, uh, with you since you yeah, are the, so the patron of this uh, layout. Yeah, this layout is kind of cool. I, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, my name's Alan Chatney, and I... Born and raised Calgarian, uh, School of Hard Knocks really started started at the ground level in the uh, in the oil and gas industry, really on the seismic side of things, and uh, had the had the incredible f- uh, fortune of uh, starting my career with Schlumberger, where uh, I, I just gained an incredible breadth of experience and and uh, and and learned a ton through that period, and then uh, left Schlumberger in 2002 to join Explore, where I've been ever since. Uh, and today, uh, today I'm the president of Explorer, which we focus on all kinds of stuff, which is, um, you know, all geoscience, uh, related, seismic related, usually in the frontiers. We like the mm-hmm. tough stuff. That's what we do. So, yeah. And, and, and you, what about you? Well, I was just about to say, I have to always add those things. A, a storied career, not, well, we won't say the long cause that just makes you sound, uh, Old. Yeah, so we'll just say a storied career in the oil and gas industry. Yeah, there you go. My son is 18 now, so two things are official. He's an adult and I'm old. Uh, <laughs> but that's how it goes, right? So, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Well, I guess a bit about myself. I'm I, I'm going to be calling myself Dr. Chris on this podcast, as I do on my social media. I pretty much spent my entire life in academic world of uh, geoscience. I uh, did a bit of, uh, did a lot of world hopping. And when I say world hopping, it was pr- pretty much uh, between here, Calgary, Alberta, and t- to Perth, Western Australia, where I... Which is literally the other side of the planet. Pretty much, you know, yeah. I almost draw a straight line and they yeah. connect. Uh, and that's where I did my PhD in Perth. And as I said before, I haven't spent much time in industry. I'm having a great time here at Explore. It's actually been uh, one of the best... Exp- the best experience of my corporate life or uh, industry life, I should yeah. say, absolutely hands down. Uh, I was, uh, to note, a what I like to call an oil casualty. And, and what do you mean by that? Oil an casualty? oil casualty. Well, I believe it was. What, what was the year? 
The collapse happened in 2014. 2014. 2014, the Saudis uh, turned, yeah. opened up the taps and, and uh, the price collapsed. Yeah, it was 2014. I was working in Perth as a depth imager. Uh, it was not the greatest job I've ever had in my life. It was pretty boring, but it was still a job. And then oil started tanking. And then all of a sudden, I was found myself unemployed with a extremely high education in geoscience and not knowing what to do. And but at least you're on the other side of the planet. Well, it was a the, the weather's nice here in Calgary today. Right now, it is minus twenty three. Ouch! I <laughs> ouch! I assume it's somewhere in the either low thirties or high twenties in Perth right now. Now that's neither, right. Well, well, the story was, though, uh, I got laid off because of multiple factors, probably most because oil's in the toilet. Yeah. And uh, if you didn't like your job, that's probably a blessing in disguise. It was anyway. the I mean, strangest I mean. blessing because it was a relief and terror at the same time. It was, oh, no, I've got a family. Oh, yes, I'm not doing that job anymore. Right. You're a, you're a few years behind. Your kids are much younger than mine. I got two yeah. boys. They're both teenagers. And yeah. one, as I said, just turned 18. Your kids are much younger, right? Yeah, now. eight, six, and four. So yeah. it was uh, more. Yeah, that's that's a heavy load when you're unemployed. When yeah, you're unemployed. and I'm, I wasn't the only one. I mean, I, I think I was one at the time. There had been layoffs, far more layoffs than uh, than I had ever seen before in my academic life. And well, do universities ever even lay people off? I mean, yes. Do they? Yes. at Because uh, okay. uh, I worked for Cruise here at the University of Calgary. Oh, yeah. Cruise has gone through. And yeah, Cruise gone has through gone some through some times. major yes, tough times. Yes, they and right. uh, they've Stupid bought, question on my part. But. Yeah. Well, it's because it's industry sponsorship. As soon as that goes down, uh, you know, jobs disappear. And I think there's only a few full-time jobs still left there. I, I can't quite comment that because I haven't talked to... One of, the emo- one of the coolest things about, about you know, your employment at Explore is that we met on LinkedIn. Yes, which... We met via social media. Imagine, right? This is, well, this is the, the genesis of something that uh, coming up two years ago or a year and a half ago? It's, yeah, like? it's about a year ago now. A little over... No, it's over it's, a year ago It's now. coming up on yeah. a year and a half, I think. We're coming up on our second year. And basically, I was looking at some of your videos on social media. I thought, these are great. You know, I got I to gotta connect with this guy. I wonder where he lives. Oh, he's in Calgary. Okay, Perfect. And then I we we had a coffee. I think I think you came into the office. We had a coffee. We kind of shot the breeze. Uh, yeah, I wasn't expecting much because yeah, oil was still thing. in the toilet. I was like, well, and that's where it came. I got laid off in Perth, and I had a choice: abandon geo, geoscience and right. do something. Or, Which oh, you did. You you kind of did. did. You yes. kind of you you kind of went in and did did a GIS. You're at SAIT even now. You're still at still at SAIT. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, taking a, what is it called? A Bachelor of GIS? It's or called something? Applied Bachelor in Geographic Information Systems, probably technology at the end. <laughs> Mouthful. Something, of, yeah. Something, something, something. Yeah. It's B-G-I-S-T something. But yeah. it's, and, and so, and, and so you joined us. I sort of said, okay, well, why don't we just have you join us and do your? You can do your work practicum here. Yeah, we need GIS support for what we do anyway. And I, and the I saw that the combination of geophysics, you know, a PhD geophysicist, and and uh, somebody that was adept at GIS and could work on the social media side. I thought, man, you know, let's just see where this goes. Let's see if there's a fit here. And and here we are, a year and a half later. I've got a, we've got a small studio set up in our office and. And, and we're doing the social media thing. It's yeah, cool. absolutely. Yeah. And it uh, it stopped me from, wait, it ceased my oil refugee status. And I probably can't say refugee in that. Let's say, what did I say? Oil casualty. I was no longer an oil casu- casualty. I was triaged and uh, <laughs> found to still be breathing. <laughs> yeah. And I was sent on the choppers uh, into the LZ here in uh, Explore. And I've uh, recovered and doing way better than I've done before. Yeah. Well, what's kind of neat about our setup, you, those of us who are those who are listening to us can't see this, of course, but we've we've spent uh, you know, this period between Christmas and New Year's, the office is kind of quiet. We've set up a little bit of a a mini studio here. We've got a right. Oh, sorry. We're we're back after some technical difficulties. We lost about 10 minutes, maybe 15 of uh, jib jab. Yeah, maybe 10, but <laughs> we were just describing the studio when yeah. this thing broke off and so we've got a little table set up. We've got four mics uh, on booms. We've got pop guards, headphones. We've got a mixing board. We've got a, we got a computer. We've got all kinds of gadgets and gadgets here. And, and I guess the reason we got four mics is we hope to have guests on 
uh, future podcasts, hey, Chris? Yes, absolutely. For, uh, guests, uh, probably, I don't, I don't want to say clients, but people we find interesting. People, yeah, interesting people that folks, are, maybe some controversial people or... You know, I'd, one of the guys I'd love to have on here in the future would be the guys from Agile. I think those, Evan, Evan uh, Beyond. Yeah, they do their and, own and, podcast. And Matt, they do their own podcast, and we could, we, could, uh, we could invite them next time they're in town. If we could figure this out properly, they don't even necessarily have to be in the room. Oh, but, there's some high tech. Yes. Some, so, no, I, I, but here's a question for you. How often are we going to do these things? Uh, I'm thinking, and my thought process on this, about two years ago now, and I want to do a video, uh, a vlog about it, was once a week. Once a week. Once a week. And as a minimum or as a max? Uh, bare minimum. Bare minimum. Bare minimum. Okay. Now, now, there's a couple of reasons for that, of course, and that's because uh, we have to get better at them and we have to repeat them over and over gotta again. We got to practice. Right? We got to practice. If we don't practice, we just, you know, it's been a month. What do we say again? No, I don't remember. Yeah. Now the next thing is is you know I don't want to say a bit of self servingness here self servedness here but it's simply to put our names out there and say hey we've got some interesting stuff to, that we're going to say and we want you to listen out there in YouTube or podcast land yeah. and uh, we try to make a commitment to you once a week. So speaking of that, uh, let's talk about 2017. 2017. We're, we're almost at the end of the year. We got 72 hours. 72 left, hours. Something like that. A little, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, a little more. <laughs> a little more. But anyway, coming up on 72 hours. Yeah, going to be a big one. And uh, you know, it's been a hell of a year. It's been a it's been a challenging year still. I yeah, think, I think the, you you know all about that. Yeah. So, so we you know we when I look at when I look at that I think gosh you know when the Saudis opened the taps they figured out that you know the, the those of us in North America that that can produce shale oil and shale. Uh, sh hydrocarbons from shale uh, weren't going to stop. Uh, it wasn't a flash in the pan. It was sustainable and, and workable, and they just opened the taps up. That was 2014, November yep. 2014, over three years ago, mm -hmm. and we're still climbing out of that downturn. And there's still people I know that uh, were laid off pretty much, I don't want to say day one, but let's say day three th years ago. <laughs> three years ago. Still not working. Some of them uh, have sort of, sort of moved on, but That's it's amazing. Tough. That's yeah. tough. Well, and I... And then, unfortunately, here here locally in Canada, we've really socked it to ourselves uh, because we're we seem to be unable to build major infrastructure projects. We seem to well, supposedly that's coming. Supposedly. Yeah, well, one of them, which is just an expansion of ex of an existing line, mm -hmm. but there have been many others canceled. I noticed today, uh, I was reading, getting caught up on on things. One of my friends in Tuck, uh, Tuck Toyuktuk, up in the Northwest Territories, he was talking. He's the mayor of Tuck. Mervyn Grubin was talking about. You know they've officially uh, ended the Mackenzie Gas Project, which ended it. Yeah, just disbanded it. Uh, now Imperial is that Imperial and the group have disbanded it. It's not going to happen. It's, it's is it a it's never going to happen or uh, it's a never going to happen? Uh, they uh, they turned it off. Once here's and foot and here's gun. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> shooting shooting ourselves in the foot, but it makes I, I can understand why because the gas market is in the toilet. Oh, that's true. And, I know, guess. It doesn't look like it's going to recover anytime soon, especially if we can't build. Uh, LNG facilities, which mm -hmm. seems to be a problem. So, so yeah, still a tough year, and I, I right. think geophysical, the geophysical industry, the seismic industry, still going through a tough time. Mm -hmm. People are still having uh, still having troubles, and and uh, you know, there's a few bright spots. Folks that have managed their balance sheets well, folks that have gone to innovation, gone to high tech, uh, mm -hmm. you know, trying new things. They mm -hmm. you know, those guys seem to be doing better, uh, but it's clear that uh, that the industry is going to change. Well, and. Uh, I so that would be put us into 2018 then, and can you foresee any of these changes, or is it still just going to be figuring things out for the next year? Yeah, I think uh, 20, you know what I see happening are a, a lot of things happening around uh, the environment. Right, mm. that's not going away. The, the you know the, we just saw the caribou uh, the draft boreal woodland caribou plan released. Uh, mm -hmm. Major changes coming for the for the seismic industry in Alberta. Um, every province is going to come up with their own plan. We're all behind schedule on this. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the motivation for the provinces to come up with this caribou plan is to make sure the feds don't usurp the provincial, uh, the provincial prerogative, which, which might happen. Right, and and right. that's very scary to think, to think of what would happen if, if the provinces can't manage their own resources as, as they should. So um, that, that's going to be a key focus. I, you know, one of the things that you see when you look at oil prices is you see – Prices for West Texas starting to touch, you know, the high 50s and the 60s. People don't look at the price of Western Canada Select, which is 
still stuck back in the 30s mm. in the low th- mm. and that discount is effectively the cost of not having our own infrastructure to take to take oil and gas to right. uh, to other other markets particularly in asia so yeah but on the political angle uh, how much will or ability will there be to expand that uh, deliverable ability i just don't i i mean i wish we had uh, frankly, stronger leadership. I don't. I don't think we have it. At the provincial level, uh, the uh, All, national, we, we've, every we've, level, at, at both the nationally and provincially. I think this idea of of being completely distracted by by uh, you know this carbon dioxide. Uh, thing has just has got us all bent in, into knots and and mm. we've put ourselves at a massive disadvantage in a way that my goodness I I don't know how long it's going to take us to pull out of that but certainly a change of government perhaps yeah, I mean that's 2019 that's not that's not 2018 I that's wonder if uh, if uh, if our audience would appreciate us getting political yes yeah, no. I, don't, I don't know we, 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 can, we may we may we've it's touched on, it we've it may be it. on our board my thoughts are no future. secret i, I no uh, no you're very uh, well documented no that and that's why we're t- you know trying to do uh some get some social media ro- media rolling and uh yeah. get some political change maybe the other thing I, I see coming technologically in 2018 is all around this sort of big data machine learning, right, uh, artificial intelligence, mm. right? The cars that are driving themselves, yeah. you know, the consolidation of Cloud data, computing. Cloud computing and the consolidation of data. Guys that can, people that can, that can stitch these, these things together from disparate sources, you well, know? The strange thing about this is it's almost going back to the original way computing was done, which was terminals logging into a main into a mainframe. That's right. And it's, I don't know if it's, what what is old is new again, or what worked in the past is best. Right. Well, and the interesting thing, if you think about your your role, GIS and the connection of surface information to what we do in the subsurface, I think that that's where value is found, is at, at connecting, uh, you know, disparate pieces of data Absolutely. And, and and assembling them into a into a big large database that you can query and you can access in an intelligent way and that makes sense and not just oh look these two things correlate and it's like yeah no the correlation is not necessarily the case well and correlation correlation doesn't mean causation yes That's, which, which is my argument on the whole co2 discussion but uh yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Now, I, some of the stuff you speak of are, it was is only possible with the advent of massive computing power. Mm-hmm. As we found out here, with we're just dealing with a raster, which is an image, you know, that's 60 gigs. That's drag on our system. Whereas, you know, in the past, it wouldn't just be a drag. Well, and, and It would have been impossible. So now when you're talking about adding all these different sources together, you're talking about adding much more computing power, which is absolutely 100% at our fingertips. Well, I mean, and if you think about data volumes, I remember first hearing about a terabyte, you know, <laughs> back, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And then, and then the first time I heard about a petabyte was with, with a large oil company that talked about the size of their seismic database. And what's interesting is now that we're shooting high density data, we're, you know, we're acquiring, yep. two weeks, we're acquiring 200 terabytes. We're, we're yep. at a rate of several petabytes a year. And looking looking forward at exabyte level storage and beyond. I mean, and that is just I don't unbelievable. Even, yeah, I don't even say it's mind blowing. I, 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 I'm of the thought now that some of the stuff we think is science fiction is not. Yeah. You know, it just is the way it is going to be. Well, and the way it's served up to us, you know, when you can sort of ask Siri a question and she answers you, and you mm-hmm. know, you look up two weeks ago, you look up something like uh, 3D printing. And then, and then, ten days later, on the side, you know, in your ads, on a completely separate platform, oh. they're advertising well, the three D well, printing. That, that's that's the go, that's you. the Google's uh, yeah. siphoning your well, information. I mean, that is that is the scary bit, you know. And I, uh, for, you, know, you know, we'll see where it all goes. Like for Christmas, I just got a, I got one of these Apple watches, which yeah. I love. I've got so a, much. I've got a Garmin. I'm a tech guy, and I love this stuff, but. You know, what I'm curious to see is, is, is my biometric data, is my heart rate information, because I said, of course, yes to everything in the licensing agreements. I just mm-hmm. click agree, agree, yeah. agree, agree. Yeah. Probably somebody somewhere is, is assembling, you know, some heart rate data for, 
let's say Calgary at in Jan, you know, December, January, and they're and, and then they're going to say, oh, he, this look at this guy. Absolutely, he's got, a, he's got a high resting heart rate. He must be overweight. Now, uh, you the, know, let's let's advertise, you know, donuts to this guy. Well, the something. tinfoil hat crowd, you know, and not to denigrate tinfoil hats or <laughs> crowds, uh, would you know be you know are very wary of that stuff. Uh, I've I've gone through phases of being wary of it. Now it's just like you know what, if it's going to make my life better somehow, why not integrate it? Yeah, and of course the risk it, the risk it carries is that one day somebody yeah. that, sh- that shouldn't have access to it has access. They know to when it. your heart beats beating. Yeah. Period. <laughs> or when you're sleeping, what your sleep habits yeah. are, when you go to bed, when you wake up. Yeah. You know, but that but but using that let's They say, know if you've been bad or good, so uh yeah. and, uh, well, and as long to as to be good for goodness sake. As long as they're good, I guess uh, it all works. But I, I think that's going to be an increasing concern as everything gets more connected, more intelligent. Machines start start learning this stuff. The algorithms start taking over. Algorithms start to well, you know, they it, do. I mean, a lot of this stuff. It, someone's not sitting there going, "I wonder what Al wants today." Does he want cloud computing? It just goes into a big algorithm. And goes, oh, he searched, he searched cloud computing. Yeah, he was looking at AWS. He was looking at Google Cloud. He was looking at Microsoft. There, there's cloud. some, there's some. Now uh, let's advertise. Exactly. Let's compete. Let's compete for that space. It's it's fascinating. Mm-hmm. And the question is, how can we use it? Exactly. How can it's, we use it in the geophysical industry? It's not fighting it. It's integrating it. Right. And and it's and it's connecting things that may, you may not think are fully connected, but they are. Mm-hmm. You know. Mm-hmm. And. Uh, uh, you know, as you know, we're we're thinking about those things. Exactly. The other the other thing that I think is interesting too is this whole generational shift that's happening. You, know, mm, you look at mm. you look at politically, you know, we're seeing the effect of of the coming of the age of the millennial generation. Which, by the way, as you know, I've hired a ton of millennials in 2017. We hired. A, we I hired think a, almost all of them are. Uh, they? All of them uh, are millennials. Yeah, cou- and a couple of us are not. And I would say, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're you're just before the millennial generation. You're, you and I are Gen Xers. But yep. The, you know, I find I find the energy to be invigorating i i find I, all of this sort of narrative of the you know of the millennials not being productive and feeling entitled and all i'm seeing none of that mm, from mm. now maybe that's because we select you know intentionally for people who you know want to go to the field and experience adventure right. and science and all those things but man I, I i'm energized by by the new generation and i think it's all about it's all about um understanding that new uh set of that new system, that new system of beliefs, if you will. Well, it, the the millennials, I think, are also into uh, gadgets. Well, we all are. And I'm into gadgets. Well, I'm into gadgets, but say, I don't know, something like my, my mom or something. Like, oh, here, mom, here's a new gadget. What? No. Yeah. I mean, to, to characterize my mother, of course. Uh, but, you know, we, we use gadgets here. Yeah. Well, and we do. We, we integrate gadgets. And I th- it's been... You know, there's been no resistance whatsoever, so that yeah. that helps the millennials. And I think uh, you looked up yesterday with the. Well, gen- I was trying to say my son was not a, is not a millennial, so he just can't. He's just your youngest. 18, yeah, my, my oldest son. Your oldest son. My oldest son was here yesterday helping us set this this studio up, and he uh, he turned 18 on December 18th. So, mm-hmm. you know, what's interesting is he's the last of the millennials because Last he was of the millennials. there's you know there was only two weeks of birthdays after him and then and then it was or no maybe it was a year actually it's a year it's a year it's a year what it was, was the end of tw- the end of 2000 is the end of the millennial uh birth dates uh, so December 31st 2000 is the last millennial birth date and then they call them they don't qu- really have a name yet it's something either generation z or Generation Z here. Z-Z, Z-Z, Z-Z as I Z-Z. say, because my kids are Australian and, and Canadian. Yeah, and then, uh, or in the UK, they're calling them linksters. Linksters. In that they're connected to everything all the time. They're totally linked, totally connected. I don't like linkster. I like Gen <laughs> Z. But uh, but we'll see where it goes. Right, and, right. And, uh, you know, but it's all, it's still all in that space of being ultra connected and ultra, uh, you know, mm. accessing mm. information that we couldn't access before. Right. Uh, but... Before we move on, I'd like to touch back on a topic. Uh, well, the the millennials talking about millennials, which you had sort of mentioned, and saying where they get a bad rap. And I don't know if that's necessarily. I don't want to say I don't want to say bad or good, but I think it's just you know, Generation X got a bad rap. 
We have every and every generation. Every gets generation a, gets the a baby bad boomers. Rap, you know, was right? rock and roll. Gen X was punk rock. Yeah, and, you know, all this kind of. The, there's yeah. only thing the things I see that new wave <laughs> disco. Oh my god! <laughs> all those flappers. What are they doing? Out? Get out of my speakeasy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, back a hundred years ago. Uh, it, it's more of when 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 I think about it, it there's problems that we all d deal with them they just deal them in in a hypersensitive i don't want to say hypersensitive hyper connected way now instead of having to wait for someone's opinion tomorrow or n next week of a friend who's away it's like you get their opinion well, 30 and, seconds and, later and the, the beauty of the beauty and the danger both of of the internet is you can do a deep dive you can dive as deep or as shallow as you want into any subject you can and you can reinforce you know, your own system of beliefs or you can you can go out and seek uh, a broad range of opinions on everything and it's up to the individual you yeah. know what they do what I, one of the things that i see is that the the old you know if you look at the political kind of spectrum the old the old uh, paradigm i think is broken um and what's those things that are liberal, those things that are conservative, I think are going to change, mm, um, mm -hmm. you know, because because the grouping, even I, who, you know, I'm a Gen Xer, I don't like the groupings anymore. I, I don't like I don't like the the package deal that comes with, you know, the conservative paradigm. Right. Right. There's things in there that I where I might find myself more on the liberal spectrum, uh, you know, when, particularly on social issues and those kinds of things. You know, I, you know, I, I, I go a different way on some of those. But things. our political system is not. It hasn't adapted. Set up that. for the nuances of differences. It's being run by the last generation, not the new generation. Oh, it's the last generation. Try the ten generation. Well, I don't want to say ten generation. Uh, whenever they set up democracy originally, right? It's yeah. like, it no, no, no. You're over here, and you're over here, and you've got to vote this way. Yeah. Blue, but then again, or you could go the American system, where it's like, you know, you could be a Democrat and only ever vote Republican. Yeah. Or the other way around. It's sort it's, of bizarre. It's, it's weird. But yeah. I, I don't know. It's, uh, it's, I think that the term is democratization of media. And there's no democratization of democracy in that same sort of sense. Like now we've got so many choices. Now it's not just go to the radio. It's now I can literally never listen to another opinion. But the, the, the challenge is that there, because of that absence of a filter, right, in the media, the it's possible that the quality of the of the uh, the content goes down. It's possible. It's possible, absolutely. Right, and it just it means that you who believe in something can go and find a whole bunch of other people who believe the same thing, even if that isn't necessarily the truth, right? And that can happen. That can happen across the board. In other words, oh no, sorry, I thought we stopped recording. But keep sorry, keep your thought going. You no, know, in, in other words, what I would sort of say is, you know. Peer review, which is a fundamental tenet of academic, of academic pursuit, is also you know that secondary source in journalism, and and I'm not sure it's there anymore. Well, I, I, there is sure. with with the social media way it is. It, the, it's called an attention economy. I'll say that again. Try to enunciate properly. Attention economy. That means if you can obviously it's it says there right in right in the words. If you can keep someone's attention long enough, they're going to listen to you. That's why it's a lot not necessarily a good thing. No, it's horrible, actually. And I've been thinking about this recently. Like things get so ridiculously polarized, not because they're actually polarized. It's because the loudest people are getting the most attention. Now, somewhere in there, someone's got to step back and go, OK, that's too loud. Let's do something different. And it's <coughs> but we're at the point now like go on Twitter, go on, you know, Facebook, go on YouTube. It's the loudest screamers, not the most level-headed that get watched most. Well, because it's boring to listen for that long, right? I mean, you know, it doesn't have to be long. It's just, who are you going to... Some of these things are complex. I don't like what you're doing and I really hate... Or like, well, let's, hey, let's take what, a step what sells, back. What sells easiest is, is uh, fear. Right, scaring people—that's that's easy to sell. Oh, it gets the adrenaline going. I mean, right. come on, like it's fear and and all those darker things. Those those are the things that are easier. And the and the more considered viewpoint, the more, you know, the more balanced viewpoint is a, is often a more complex, more nuanced thing. Mm. And and the question is, will will the will social media adapt to serve that up, or will it remain vulnerable to that sort of you know that sort of it's not social media viral people feed 
people have to I think people have to make a concerted concerted effort to avoid that but two things have to happen the people have to do it and then the platforms have to be there to allow them to do it right because if if you can't if 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 when you search for something you're served up whatever whatever sells um but they used to what they go is is by what's popular what's being clicked most that's the problem right right do you want a company controlling what's clicked most Mm. not necessarily it's i think it's an education now uh, maybe i've got too much so they should go they should prioritize peer-reviewed journals oh no 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 it's I mean, because definitely in here's school. Here's the other problem. You've got Elsevier and these other agencies that control the peer-reviewed journals. They don't want to. No, they no, don't want to give them away for free. Well, right? that's, not, a, that's a for-profit business. This is in, in my in 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 my thing, thinking. Uh, academic is different than the court of public opinion, right? Mm-hmm. Or public the sphere of public opinion. What we would have to do is, and this is not just for millennials. It's for anybody using social media. Is somewhere in there, and maybe it's taught at schools. I don't know is to, to discern like here you know this is how you use social here's a tool this is how you use it properly go yeah <laughs> well there i mean in in uh, the school system in the school system has not adapted itself well to any uh, new information technology platform oh, and we're going to take a quick pause here i think <coughs> now there we go through the magic of podcast uh, land, I ha- we ha- took a bit of a break, and now we're back to finish up the podcast uh, talking about, for lighten it up a bit, movies. Yeah, exactly. Well, we got interrupted by an accountant who, uh, who was on a mission, <laughs> and uh, with it being year-end and all... Uh, it was a know, little bit he's, important. He's excused. It's, it's a little bit important to get our year-end sorted out. Yeah. So, so that's happened. Um, <clears throat> we, were, we sort of left off talking about school. Yeah, one of the things that that our family does uh, this time of the year is we start looking ahead to the Oscars, and mm. uh, it's a tradition in our family to kind of, okay, who are the contenders? Who, you know, what films are likely to be considered for an Oscar nomination? Right, of course, right. they're not out yet. Not, not like nothing, or there's just a speculation. It's all speculation. All speculation. And my, and my my youngest son is a bit of a film buff. And, and can carve up a script like nothing. Uh, you know, his criticism of the new Star Wars movie was, what the hell was the first half about? Without spoiling anything for anybody. Yeah, I, he, he me, basically, me as well. <laughs> yeah, I won't, I won't be spoiling the anything. first but, half. Actually, I, I've, but he I've sort seen of said, stuff. He sort of said, you know, the, the whole first half, Dad, he goes, if you take it out, does it affect the movie at all? And I sort of said, well, good, good point. Actually, maybe it doesn't. But, you know, one of the great things that, that we've been doing is taking in all these amazing films that are likely to be considered. Mm. Um, you know, uh, Dunkirk probably is figures prominently in the Oscar, right? In the Oscar and, uh, and historical nominations, piece nominations, a historical piece. I went to see Darkest Hour over the the Darkest Hour. Another which, historical piece. Another historical same uh, same time. Gary of Oldman. Gary Oldman in that thing is phenomenal mm. as Winston Churchill. Mm. Uh, I'd be surprised if he doesn't take a Best Actor, at least nomination, right, uh, right. away. And what was amazing about The dark, Darkest Hour, I tweeted about this, I'm sitting there getting ready to watch the film, and I look over to my right, Jason Kenney's sitting there. Oh, uh, in the same, in, in in the the, same, in the same oh, aisle, like four for, seats for, down. For those people who are listening to the podcast and don't know who Jason Kenney is. He's I'll the let... new uh, leader of the United Conservative Party here in Alberta. Uh, you know, one conservative leader looking at another here in Winston Churchill uh, uh, it was kind of neat. And then, and then the lights turned on at the end of the film. I got up to put on my jacket. I looked back three rows back. Guess who's sitting three rows back directly behind us? None other than Stephen Harper. No, not kidding. And I did said, you take a <laughs> selfie with him? <them? laughs> no. Yo, what's no. up? <laughs> no, I think everybody appreciates having that boxing now, day to themselves. Now, again, so. you just to fill in those of us, uh, those in the audience who don't know who Stephen Harper is. Former it, Prime Minister. I mean, how could you not know who well, Stephen know, Harper you, is? Come someone, on. In, someone in the U.S. Somebody like, who's been living in Australia who, doing mm, geophysics. I am. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, no, so that was that was really neat. And, mm. and uh, you know, conservative leaders watching other conservative leaders. Kind of neat. Um, I, I, I will say that last night I watched The Big Sick. Have you seen that one? No, I. That's an. Is that this year? It's this year. Ah, it was okay. this summer. Independent film. Okay. Written and uh, a, a screenplay by a couple who, sort of a multicultural couple, uh, 
Mm. And it, what a what a striking film! Just mm. had everything. Mm. If you if you watch one film this Oscar season, that that would be my pick. Right, I mean, just right. delightful, delightful movie. So, so you're you're sort of in that lucky zone where you're you have kids probably old enough to watch the movies. Where mine still are into the, uh, you know, cartoonish ones. Yeah. I don't think yeah. they would uh, appreciate Dunkirk, uh, no. or, or maybe no. have nightmares, perhaps, or just be very concerned about the world in general after watching that. Yeah, no, yeah. it's an amazing, amazing film, amazing cinematography. Mm. So we actually did watch for the first time. Well, my kids for the first time, E.T. Oh wow! Two days ago, that's an oldie. Yes, that is now. A, that's got to be a classic. Nineteen eighty-three. Yeah, and uh, I remember seeing that in the theater when I was a little young and. Well, let me phrase that. I remember going to the theater. I don't remember anything about the movie other than what I've seen later in life. Yeah, and you would have been very... I was 13, so yeah, you would have been yeah, was, younger. Yeah, six. Six, there you go. Yeah. And uh, now I was watching my son's face, who's uh, four, when E.T. comes... Oh, wait, spoiler alerts for oh, those of you... come on, <laughs> E.T., 1983. You're allowed to spoil it. Well, who knows? Flip. There could be some millennial, or what was it called? Linkster or... Linkster Gen, 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 Gen Z. Yeah, Gen Z listening to us right now. But I was watching my son's face when E.T. comes alive, and he had this giant smile on his face, yeah. like, oh, my God. Yeah, that's funny, yeah. No, and, and, you know, Steven Spielberg, who directed E.T., is directing another film that's an Oscar contender. This... And it's almost not even fair. It's mm. called the Post. Uh, the Steve, Post. The Post. It's about the Washington Post. And, oh, is that you know the, they're standing up against uh, the tyranny of Nixon and Vietnam. Okay, and that whole thing, right, which right. Close parallels to today, probably in their minds. But anyway, try to make themselves more relevant than they currently yeah, feel they are. But it's like, but Steven, so this thing's a contender, and you look at it and you go, okay, Steven Spielberg's directing. Tom Hanks is the is the actor, and Meryl Streep's the best act <laughs> is the actress. It's like I said to my Let's wife, "Let's just stack everybody this over this here." This isn't even fair. This is like the New York Yankees mm, uh, you mm. know, in baseball. But anyway, so yeah. I mean, have so you've seen almost all of them? Are you? No, are, I, the one that I'm really looking forward to is Three Billboards in Ebbing, uh, Missouri. I, I my understanding is that Frances McDormand does an incredible job in that film, and I always enjoy her films, Fargo. McDormand? And, yeah, Frances, Mc, yeah, she's... McDermott? No, I think it's McDormand. But uh, yeah, well. anyway, she's she's delightful, and, and uh, I think it's a dark film. Mm-hmm. I think it's a it's a challenging one to watch, but I'm looking forward to it. Right, so, good, yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah, so. I should uh, probably put, uh, maybe I'll, I'll start doing that, put them on the list of stuff I watch after hours when the kids are in bed. Yeah, it's and I mean, the Oscars do a good job of directing your attention to to uh, higher quality movies, mm, I would say, mm. yeah, broadly speaking. There uh, are exceptions. But. Well, I'm a science fiction guy, so is... Uh, yeah, well, Star Wars, <laughs> you can't go wrong. <laughs> I'm sure that won't win an Oscar. Or my special effects, I suppose. It might, it I could, mean, it could win some Here's special, special effects, effects now, though. Type it into a computer. There we go, special effects. Yeah, so. CGI, it's <laughs> all good. Like yeah. how, can, how can you ever win it now well, you, when it's all the same? Well, you invent something new. Right? Mm. Mm. Come up with a new algorithm that does it better. Yeah, I suppose, better. right. And it's actually snowing rather than these little dots sort of accumulating, floating down the screen. Yeah. Which they do anyways. Yeah. Uh, is there anything else we can, or is this now good for the outro? We are at approximately 40 minutes. That's lots. Yeah, Who absolutely. Who wants to listen to us for 45 hey, do, minutes? Do we have an outro music ready? No. No, we don't. <laughs> Today we're just gonna do, have to. Do, do, yeah, do, do, just, do, do, do. Chris well, is providing the outro. Well, unless you're, you may still be connected. No, to I'm it. not. I'm, I'm oh. not connected to Bluetooth. <laughs> See, we're these are the uh, these are the learning curves here uh, as we as we learn the new. Well, in studio. the future, what we would just have it is on this one computer. Yeah, I think. I but think so. I think we got it all on the. computer. All right. So well, let's sign out here. I'm uh, Doctor Chris, and I'm Alan Chatney, and this is I uh, guess podcast one of Source Points. Excellent. Do 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 do